This is an after school program podcast. Welcome to the Home Studio Hangout Podcast, where we explore what it's like building, running, and working out of a home studio with your hosts, Joshua Matatuck, Andrew Simmons, and many guests in different areas of the music industry. Well, my name's Josh, and I'm being interviewed today. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> take it away all right yeah welcome back today is i guess this will end up being the first episode of interviews but it'll be an interview with our friend josh who you've been listening to talk about audio stuff with me for the past couple episodes i just Hello, Josh. To thank you guys so much for inviting me on this podcast <laughs> it's a pleasure what you don't know is josh has the rona <laughs> i do apparently well i'm hoping not anymore it's hoping been not anymore. today marks 14 days since my positive test and it would be like day 15 to 20 of being exposed to it so i should be good let's do it let's do it like this i think this will be fun this is something we could start doing um hi my name is andrew and i I like it like a like an AA meeting. We'll do it like an AA meeting. <laughs> Hi, my name is Andrew, and I uh, um, spent all weekend mixing sad acoustic Americana in the back of a minivan. <laughs> Hi, my name is Josh. <laughs> I spent all weekend writing music <laughs> that is not sad Americana. However, it's still sad. <laughs> And building a website and a new contact form and linking it all with pipe drive and being really excited that they fixed the integration between type form and pipe drive because before you had to link the API and it didn't work that well, but now it works really well. <laughs> and that's some nerd stuff. For you. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they're here for. This We're is the, the content that they are here for. This is what the, this is what the kids want, man. We're exactly. doing it for the kids. We do it for the kids. <laughs> oh man uh we're having right. a daytime podcast today i know daytime firing pod. it on all cylinders what the heck i have a feeling that my wife's gonna come home from work in like 45 minutes and be like you normally do this at night what the heck and you're gonna be like it's daytime baby and be like daytime pod it's a daytime pod so today we're talking to josh about his life and stuff sick <laughs> so josh let's get started uh first things first where are you from josh i let's take it back to the beginning the city of champions <laughs> also known as the steel city also known as back-to-back -back stanley cup champions city pittsburgh pennsylvania for those that care about hockey <laughs> We have a bunch of Super Bowls, but football's boring. That's true. <laughs> it's so boring. My friends hate me for that because they're like football fans first. Well, yeah, hockey fans second. I think of I think of Pittsburgh as more of a football city. Obviously, it is. It but... is, dude. They have like Steelers bars in other cities. It's crazy. Really, I didn't know that. Yeah, dude. There's one in uh. There's one I think in North Carolina. Um, it's literally a like a, a pittsburgh bar like you go there and there's just like steelers merch everywhere and they probably talk about how great pittsburgh is even though that everybody who <laughs> is there moved has away from never, pittsburgh <laughs> or has never actually been to pittsburgh or yeah or, or they've once. never actually been to pittsburgh so <laughs> so you're from the north yeah man let's talk about it what was it like growing up in the north um so I didn't grow up in the city. I grew up in the suburbs, uh, like 25 minutes north of Pittsburgh um, in a place called Economy Borough. Um, so I went to good old Ambridge area high school, which is the uh, which is just another like like how Pittsburgh works is you have like this city. And then as you get further out, you have a lot of these old rust towns. So mm -hmm. um a lot of them are like poor communities. Um, and so Ambridge, you know, like it wasn't 
super fancy by any means. Uh, a lot of things were beaten down. Um, but it was cool, like, growing up there because now, like, Ambridge is starting to rebuild and come back from steel leaving the area back in like the 70s or whatever mm -hmm. so um it's actually a really neat place um right now because there's a lot of cool changes being made you know like in a lot of ways it's turning into a miniature silicon valley that's really um, cool art is huge there um you know like we just found these lofts downtown oh, yeah. on yeah, the south side where that, yeah. it literally they give priority to artists, regardless of what kind of art you make. If you're an artist, you get cheaper rent and you get priority over people who are not artists to live there. That's really cool. And like they have like suites where they actually have like art galleries in them for you to that, hang so up that, your art that, and work on art. I was going to say, and that's now versus 20 years plus years ago. Yeah. So and what what's it crazy like? is so like 20 years ago, well, longer than, oh my gosh, it's 2020. Yeah, um, dude. So 30, 40 years ago, Pittsburgh yeah. was like a huge music city. Really? Um, yeah. So the Civic Arena, which was like um, their big arena at the time, mm -hmm. it was like basically sold out like night after night with massive tours that would come through. And then slowly but surely, um, Music kind of left the area once promoters got a little greedy and yeah stuff like that. And it's like the kind of thing where like growing up there, like I even felt that because I'd be wondering why like my favorite band didn't come through. Um, you know, there were times whenever, you know, a date or a member would pull through and they would sell out two nights in a row. The 1975 did the same thing. Mm -hmm. But then, um, you know, it's very much like a hit or miss city. Like you would pull up to, um, I remember we saw Laney there. Like before they blew up, mm -hmm. and they were still big though. Like their yeah. Spotify numbers were strong, so you know I'm sure that their label did a lot of market research on like what kind of venue to book, and they booked a 750 cap venue, and uh, literally there was probably like 70 people there. Ooh, yeah, it was nuts. And honestly, heard, like props to them for still of, playing the show. I've heard um, a lot of people say kind of the same thing, even from back in the day. I remember, um. I think it was Jason that was telling me that they always had a hard time becoming the archetype, always had a hard time playing Pittsburgh um, because they weren't huge. And I think basically if you weren't absolutely massive, you had a hard time yeah, playing. That's there. how it works. Like trying to play local shows there on tours that came through. Like, I mean, I call them local, but I mean like 150 yeah. to 300 yeah. cap venues. Yeah. Like, trying to sell tickets to get people there was so hard and it, it sucked though because like you know you want to have people go there to see you but you would think it would mm -hmm. be easier because it's like oh yeah you're a fan of this band like we have cheaper tickets just buy them from us come yeah. hang out we'll give you merch whatever and it was like pulling teeth and um yeah it's just a weird place man it's a weird place for music um, so yeah, let's let's get into that. How did you grow up and get into music living in a place that didn't really prioritize music at the time on a lower level? So my father, Jack, he has been gigging since he was a kid in the area and um, has all kinds of cool stories of playing shows. And uh, he was in his 20s whenever like new wave and alt rock were the new mm -hmm. thing and so uh you know the cure the replacements nirvana you're talking um, like early 90s yeah late yeah. 80s early late 90s, 80s early 90s, that's whenever yeah. he was like really kind of hitting it hard and in, in his in the prime bird. music um, time so you know being that he's like super into that sort of thing I was built my first guitar before I was born, hmm. which is pretty cool. That's pretty tight. Yeah. He built a guitar for me before I was even born. And um, it's still it's still a thing. I didn't even bring it to Florida with me because I was afraid of losing it. Yeah. Um, And I'm going to like redo it. So it's in tip top shape and it'll be cool. Ready cool for rig some tracking to have around. But uh, yeah, my dad built me my first guitar before I was born. Um. 
because of that, you know, I grew up listening to like alt rock, all those kids, they always get into like classic rock. So that was the mm-hmm. thing in like elementary school until I found out about, you know, like, um, the big one for me was Linkin Park. Cause I was like, whenever Meteora was huge and that was the first CD I ever owned. So, you know, I remember yeah, listening to Meteora and just being like, this is so cool and learning how to play guitar. Um, and then towards the end of elementary school was whenever I started playing drums and I started listening to bands like Under Oath and A Day to Remember and stuff like that. So by the time I got to junior high, I was very much like, I'm going to be in a band when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want to tour the world and be on big stages playing heavy music. Exactly. And then, exactly. And then reality happened. And then reality, thankfully reality set in for me sooner than later. That's good. Um, So by the time I graduated, like I had a pretty good grasp on like how the music industry works and Mm -hmm. what really goes into it. So as far as like playing shows and self-promotion and stuff like that, or as far as like um, pretty much like, like I understood like what bands have to do to grow, how the industry okay. is changing towards like online promotion instead of just like DIY tours until you. What die. I was going to say that was probably um, around the same time that like Facebook promotion th- was becoming more of a thing, and like MySpace had happened because you were in t- under oath, so like MySpace was had already kind of passed by, but and that was just dabbling in the whole like self-promotion on the internet kind of thing but then we hit like the facebook and we start moving into the streaming era yeah around that so time. The, the to put this to put like a time stamp for you the year i graduated was um whenever i got really into the 1975 self-titled because their second album wasn't out yet um okay no sleep by volumes was on repeat uh Ooh, death sentence record. by those who fear and the death car best sworn in even though that came out like a year before or something like that yeah those were like the records that i listened to my senior year so yeah like online promotion was definitely how everything was and you know some people were still not believing in that but yeah um yeah so i kind of grew up in that weird like kind of transition period where it kind of hit me where i was like well if i just go on diy tours like i'm gonna burn out of money because nobody seems to care anymore Mm mm-hmm and so I got to do this the right way. This and was like 2013, 2014. Right what? This was like 2013, 2014, right? Somewhere around in there. Yeah. So I graduated in 2015. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, I had a real big like prog metal phase early on in high school, like 2010, 2011. I listened to a lot of like Vale Maya and Periphery and Heck yeah. it made me really, really good at guitar and I had no clue how to write a song. <laughs> and so but you once I riff. got into like less crazy music, I started yeah. to really kind of dive into songwriting and tried to like figure out what works, what doesn't. Um, yeah. What's so. interesting about that is some of those same prog metal bands that you just mentioned now have gotten much better at writing songs too i think like back at the time that you were listening to them they were riff salad pretty much yeah dude and eclipse by vela maya dude i still want to cover that record front to back it's so good doing it's one so take I'm but then like it. even just the record after that with the new vocalist um they learned how to write songs they learned how to write choruses yeah um so yeah, I think what's interesting that that's kind of interesting in a sense because as you grew and also learned how to write better songs global scale uh they kind of did too. So I don't think you were I think you were yeah. kind of growing with the scene in that way. Yeah. And then like, you know, growing up in Pittsburgh, like everybody by default is a fan of Mac Miller. And so yeah. um Whenever I was in high school, he dropped watching movies with the sound off. And that was like the first hip hop record that I like really got into. Mm -hmm. Because to me, like as an outsider to the genre, like hip hop was very like superficial and not very artistic. 
Mm -hmm. you know and at the time i was in this headspace of like everything has to be like off the wall that's why i was into prog music you know Mm -hmm. so i remember listening to that record and i was just blown away because he was able to just like take you to this dimension that he created and recorded and put out and um that record's also neat because every single song has like a different producer on it but it all sounds like it's just the same place um and plus it was really dark i was really attracted to dark music Mm -hmm. um i still am you know i love darker music i just like happy songs now but with dark lyrics (laughs) and um so that was really cool because that really opened it up to well now music isn't just like crazy guitar riffs and so my other my other question was going to be what was kind of the to paint a clearer picture like what was the kind of the the scene in pittsburgh that you grew up in like pittsburgh as a city obviously like mac miller's from there but then you also have bands like i believe circus survive is from there too um so are they i i know anthony green is oh he's from pittsburgh Mm -hmm. i didn't know that yeah i'm pretty sure he is either he's from there or from philly i can't remember I know he's from Pennsylvania, but he's in from one of those two places, and I can't remember which That's one. That's interesting. But I thought he was from Pittsburgh. So, but regardless, the, like, what was the overarching sense of music? Yeah. So I came up on at like the tail end of just about everything. So whenever I was in elementary school, that's whenever there was this place in Rochester called the Blue Violet Cafe, and it was like a DIY venue that was owned by a church, and. A bunch of like my friends older brothers played there which is funny because like i'm friends with all of them now Mm -hmm. and um like not only was it for the local scene but like tours would come through like Mm -hmm. in fear and faith played there veil played there with like after the burial and born of osiris like i mean this is like 2008 2009 yeah and they weren't really so they weren't that big, but they had a huge underground cult following. Yeah. And I remember like, you know, cause like my class, like nobody really liked that kind of music. It was like me and like four other kids, you know, like we all liked that. And then I remember like we would go to the high school for certain events and like, you know, I would see people wearing like Chiodos and Under Oath shirts and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. I was just like, oh, this is so cool. Like can't wait to be around more people and it didn't dawn on me until i got older that those people would have graduated by then yeah (laughs) so i kind of came up on the tail end of things like i went to a few shows at the blue violet and it ended up shutting down um and then it wasn't until i graduated that i really found other like diy venues but it like at the same time like the local scene kind of declined yeah and so all you would see were like, you know, a band would pop up, break up, and then their members would go start other local bands and then they'd all break up. And it was kind of unstable. You know, there weren't really too many bands that really came out of there. Um, fun fact, my friend Jonah, he saw Code Orange whenever they were still high school kids. Even when they were still high school kids, they were very angry. <laughs> Dude. So, okay. Do you know how I found out about Code Orange? I was a sophomore in high school and I had a student teacher and I believe his name was Nate. I think we all called him Mr. Nate. And he was like, Hey man, so I see that you're into like sort of this genre and I only buy vinyl because I'm a hipster. (laughs) So I'm going to give you my download code to this record and I want you to listen to it. And I remember listening to that and that was like a moment for me because the first one i was like oh so this is just as like creative as prog music but it's way more abstract no super very industrial because that was stuff is super industrial. that was whenever they were still code orange kids mm-hmm. so that was um the one i forget what it's called i forget their first one but uh it's the one with flower mouth on it mm-hmm and that record that rocked my world because i was like still into like prog music still into metalcore Mm -hmm. but now i'm listening to like this abstract hip-hop music 
and I'm also listening to now this crazy creative hardcore music and um it was also cool because like you know they're from my hometown and so I kind of felt like there were like pieces of like the collective experience of growing up in the area like ingrained in their music yeah um it's it's love is love return to dust that's right love is love return to dust i knew that there was dust in it yeah and uh yeah so that was cool um trying to think of anything else that's really significant about like pittsburgh with music because like i i don't know i hate to sound so jaded but it really is the truth like the city isn't the greatest for music at all (laughs) um you know, because, and I kind of came up at like the tail end of a lot of things, whether it's mm-hmm. like the scene or like, you know, the stigma behind like working remotely versus in person. So, like, all I've ever known is that if you're going to play a show, play it in a different city because people care about you more. And if you're going to work with people, work with people who aren't from your hometown who know you because they're going to pay you more. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and I double I double checked. Circus from Philly, not from Pittsburgh. Oh uh, yeah, that's why I never knew that. Cause yeah, it's not true. Philadelphia sucks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's say so you graduate. You're kind of at the tail end of all the music stuff. You're learning about hip hop at this point, kind of. What? So was college on your horizon really, or did where did you decide like? as you were graduating high school that you were like nah I just want to do music the music thing Uh, yeah I never wanted to go to college my mom wanted me to go because like it's what she grew up in a time where you went to college and then you made 60 grand right out the door and everything was fine and dandy so in her mind like I would go to college for music and I would graduate and then I would go work at a studio and make you know, close to six figures and be out of debt in a few years, you know? Mm -hmm. And it took me a lot of time to like get her to understand that like if I go to school for music and I go work in a studio, I'll still make 15 to $20 an hour, except like we're talking like a $40,000 a year school. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and at the time this was like you said, 2015 when you graduated. So yeah five years ago that was still studios were partially on the downturn at that point too like physical yeah. studios were partially yeah. on the downturn and um, like especially back home like there's nothing there there yeah, is only yeah. and because there's nothing there studios are actually really expensive so, because um, they have to make up they have to make every single project be multiple yeah. months of a rent Exactly. Or lease or so paying bills. So the stuff. only studio that I could rent out there is, I'm not going to say the rates because I just want to shout out Matt at Fire K Studios because that place is incredible. They built mm-hmm. that place by hand, him and his co-owner, and he's just the best dude and he deserves all the work in the world. Mm-hmm. But to put things into perspective, I could go to LA and rent a nicer studio for almost half the price that I would pay there. Yeah, but that's just because there are studios every two blocks or less yeah in la so and it's the same yeah. thing in new york it's a lot cheaper to rent plus spaces in new york it's cheaper to rate rent spaces in atlanta which i do all the time yeah it's cheaper to rent spaces down here well yeah and just in, in florida I'm yeah in, yeah and so this place sucks <laughs> <laughs> um all right so you're so you decide not to go to college out of high school you're like hey mom so if i go to college and i take on forty thousand dollars worth of debt for this degree per year for this degree um i'm gonna leave with a hundred and twenty thousand dollars worth of debt and a 15 an hour job uh so she says okay cool what's your trajectory from there on trying to do music so from there i was in kind of this rough spot because I knew what I had to do. I knew that I was capable of doing it, but I just wasn't at the level yet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like for instance, my brother, he graduated high school and already was working an internship with Pittsburgh's esports team because he was that good. 
Yeah. I wasn't. When I was 15, I started working at McDonald's so I could get a recording rig. Yeah. You know? And all he had to do was save up some Christmas money and buy himself a DSLR and start shooting, you know? Price points and, are a little um, different on those two things also when you're talking about recording rig versus just a singular camera to get started. Right. And, you know, so that's that's been... I don't know. That was kind of rough because it's like I didn't have all these great resources and like I would take like all the online classes that you could buy and stuff like that to like Mm -hmm. learn about mixing. And in my head, you know, um, because I think that that was right around whenever Brian Hood was starting the six figure home studio. Yeah, Um, it was it was the uh, the blog. The blog was going around. Yeah, about 2015. And so I was like, oh, I'm just going to mix heavy music. That's what I'm gonna do. That's what you. That's what you listened to at that point. You really liked it. Yeah. So I was like, oh, that's just what I'm gonna do. So all of my work really went into like, how can I get better at mixing? And I was listening on cheap monitors in an untreated room. <laughs> which after moving out of that room, I learned a lot about that room. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I really didn't. I really didn't get mixing, and I was like putting all my time into like yeah but like i could make this sound so much better and i could do this and that and take this course and do this and i got to the point where like i can mix but i'm not great and i don't think that i'll ever be great until i'm probably like well into my 30s because it's just something that you know after four years so we're talking like 2018 Mm mm-hmm like I, it finally hit me where I was like, oh, I probably shouldn't try to mix. Um, so 2018, talking about two-ish years ago, you yeah. you you decide, eh, I should probably not mix. So how yep. did you how did you go from, well, crap, maybe I should just produce stuff, yeah. or so start writing right out of high school, started working as a lot attendant at a car dealer. Um, during that time, I started up a band and I was self-producing everything. And I realized I was really good at like producing and making sounds how I want them to sound. I just wasn't good at mixing. Mm-hmm. So because of that, some bands were hitting me up to like work with them and it was nothing crazy. And my friend Sam hit me up through that as well. Well, no, it wasn't even Sam. It was Jason because I knew Jason beforehand. So he introduced me to Sam and was like, hey, you're going to have us um, do our thing and you're just going to record it, right? <laughs> and <laughs> I was like, yeah, dude, let's do it. <laughs> it came out terribly. But it um, introduced me to Sam and we started writing together. Cause, and that is really like, the relationship that I made that really started making me understand like writing is everything. Mm-hmm. And in this day and age, like the next generation of kids are going to come up like ready to mix a record on their yeah. laptop or they're going to be ready to produce a record on their laptop. But what they're not going to be able to do is write great songs, you know? Yeah. Because, like, personally, I think that anybody can learn how to mix. Even I can if I put more time into it. Mm -hmm. And anybody can learn how to, like, record something. But there's no, like, set formula to writing a song. Or just being creative in general. Right, you know? And so, like, that's whenever I really started just focusing on writing and... um you know, it took me a while to really get to the point where I thought that I was making anything that was like really good, Mm -hmm. you know? And now like that's from the time I graduated, you know, 2015, 2016 and 17, I was doing the band stuff. So it's been about like three years, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, because I'm still fairly new to all this. And it wasn't until about a year and a half ago that I started getting hired for writing projects a lot Mm -hmm. and so 
all I do now really is I work on writing. Um, and even now, you know, it's not like I, you know, I feel like a lot of these writers, like they'll put out the same quality of stuff mm-hmm. and then they'll just like have those songs that just connect with more people or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like I'm definitely not at that point. You know, it's like every time I write another song now, like it still feels like it's so much better than the last one. Yeah. Um, so I'm still pretty new to this and it's really exciting though, because, um, learning how the industry kind of hates writers as far as like making a living, but then also seeing how like it's very possible to make a living at the same time is the coolest thing in the world. Um, so, (laughs) So now, so we're kind of caught up roughly to now days. So we're, so now you're doing mainly top lining, which would be considered the lyric and melody portion of a song. Uh, And you do production, correct? So like some extra, you'll track or you'll, co-write or you'll do different synth work or post work thing things like that right yeah so what um because like i'm still sorry i burped (laughs) it's that diet ginger beer (laughs) so um yeah i'm still like i don't know things are still just changing so quickly for me Mm -hmm. you know because I'm still in like a trial and error mode where it's like, well, what works? What doesn't work? What do I like doing? What don't I like doing? What do people want me to do? What do mm-hmm. I hate that people want me to do? What do I love that people want me to do? So, you know, I'm still in like that period where like I'm slowly narrowing down like what I do. And you're but, eliminating um, things too, kind of. From what I've seen, at least you're you're very much like trying a bunch of stuff and then eliminating the things that work the least amount and then trying what's left over and then eliminating again and then yeah. kind of repeating that process down. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, at the end of the day, like anybody can come to me and like, sure, like I'll produce your record. Sure. I could probably mix your record unless if it's like metal. <laughs> well, not just, I mean, if it's, if it's like really, really heavy, like modern metal, I'll destroy that mix. It'll be yeah. so good. But, you know, the other kinds of metal. Yeah. But like, yeah. So what I'm what I'm starting to learn is that if it's anything 80s new wave, 90s alt rock Mm -hmm. and um, sad, then I'm probably really good at it. Um, If it's modern radio rock, like some serious X, serious XM octane. Yeah. butt rock. That's my cup of tea. You know, so, like, I'm starting to learn, like, what I'm really good at and what I need to work on. What your inclinations kind of are. What? What your inclinations kind of are. Right, yeah. Because, like, what I did last year is, like, last year was my first year being freelance. And Mm -hmm. I killed myself working on a lot of projects that I hated. And um, it burnt me out to the point where once my illegal sublease had filed for bankruptcy and I had to move out of my studio at a moment's notice... I stopped taking out projects until I ended up moving here to Florida on a whim. So, you know, I'm, uh, it's cool though. Cause whenever you like hate what you do, but then you're still saying yes, then like, that's a good sign that you enjoy it. Yeah. So you, you, you it's cool. Sometimes, sometimes all you really need is to hit rock bottom so you could rebuild how you want to, you know, lyric. And so if, (laughs) uh, if I have to do it again, just to make sure that I'm even happier next year, I'll, I'll do it again in a heartbeat. Heck yeah, dude. Um, but yeah, so at the end of the day, like if you would have told me whenever I was a senior in high school that I was going to be writing top lines for most of my audio work, I would have told you that you were crazy. Because one, <laughs> back then I did not sing. I didn't even scream. And I didn't know the first thing about writing. And I would have just been like, no, nah, man, I failed music theory class. <laughs> There's no way, you know? And um, I would have just been like, nope, I'm going to mix records till the day that I die. So <clears throat> we'll get into the, let's, let's move on. I have like two more things. So number one, what is the first, what is the, not first, what is the biggest lesson from the last five years 
that you would tell yourself from five years ago that has to do with production? Dang, I was about to go on a tangent about mental health. I mean, that has to do with production, so. Yeah, it does. So just because you're not good at something doesn't mean that you'll be better at it. And just because you're good at something doesn't mean you should do it. Ooh. Because good. I was good at just writing metalcore songs and I was I got the mix down to like Hello. I'm gonna finish this podcast. Be done in a second. <laughs> Wife just got home. Very nice. Continue. So, yeah, I was just taking on all of these metalcore projects, mm-hmm. and I would just write them. I'd do the top line, track the vocals, mix it, master, release it. And I was just saying yes to everything that came through because, like, that's what I did, right? Yeah. I'm your boy for it. And I hated it. I worked with a lot of artists who didn't care, that didn't want to pay me, that would pay me and then never finish a song. I literally have like 10 songs on my hard drive right now where they paid 75% of my rate and they haven't finished the song. (laughs) Literally almost half of my work, like these people were so unmotivated, they didn't even finish working with me. Dang. And like at the end of the day, the songs aren't bad. They're pretty good actually, you know? But um, yeah, it made me realize that like you can get better if you just try and it's really easy to get better whenever you find out what you're passionate about. It's true. And so, you know, listening, cause like, you know, I would work on metal songs all day. Last thing I wanted to listen to is metal. So I'd be listening to the 1975 and Laney and, um, bunch of pop music. You know, I got into citizen Thank you. Shout out to Sam and Jason um super heavy in microwave like the i didn't want to work on metal anymore <laughs> you know yeah no for sure i think the, the the key there is finding i don't remember who said this but it's finding the intersection between what you're good at and what you're passionate about yeah it's where you find when you find like that that area where you need to find, make a job yeah, turns out I'm super passionate about either very heavy songs with like trap and pro- pop production <laughs> or I'm really passionate about like radio friendly yet still heavy music with pop yeah. production. And Heck yeah. Also anything alt rock. For sure. Alt rock is so good. And like, uh, I don't know, I get into like indie pop and stuff like that and synth pop. and Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just really, was, dep- if it's good music. If right. it's good. Right. If it's good. <laughs> you know, a good song's a good song. Yeah, exactly. Um, Yeah. So that's probably my biggest piece of advice is like, don't get bummed out because you're not good at what you're doing because in five years, you're, you're not going to be doing it anyway. <laughs> For sure. Uh, And then the other thing is I want to do, we're going to probably do this for everybody. Um, get Let's do a top five bands of all time. Top five bands of all time. All right. So start at number five and go up. Number unless you so want to start. So they have to be in order. Unless you want to start. Ah, uh, you could do no order. All right. Just top no five order. bands. No order. All okay. Right, here we go. So we're gonna go with the Cure, the 1975. Um. You start. You came in on the self-titled, right? So you missed the EP, 1975 era. Yeah. Maddie was listening to them during the EP. Got you. So and I was too stubborn to listen to them. Dude, they're so good. They came from the scene, which is crazy. Yeah, it's it's nuts. But yeah, so the Cure, the 1975. Um, we're gonna go with. (sighs) Microwave, because Mm -hmm. Death Is Warm Blanket is one of the coolest records ever written. One of the best albums from last year. The best album of last year. (laughs) Um, this is tough because I kind of want to do like the classics and then I also want to do like the song, like the bands that are like sentimental to me, 
but then also like i think that like it's art so it doesn't matter if it's sentimental to me because it doesn't matter and i should be doing this purely on what i think of the songs right now because when i was a kid i would have been like under oath but now i'm like yeah like sure those songs still resonate with me but i will say that i really don't care that much anymore um (laughs) All right, who else is real artsy? <laughs> you know what? Super Heaven. Oh. Gotcha. They, they were like kind of... The 90s like, kids that weren't born in the 90s. Yeah, they're 90s, not born in the 90s. Yeah. And then... Man, because this is all time favorite, and there's so many competing for that last spot. That's fine. Just give just give me one, or give me a couple of them that are competing right, for that last spot. All right, dude. We're we're just gonna say it. We're gonna say Nirvana. Oh, okay. I'm gonna. Say I thought it. you were gonna go bring me. Be- oh yeah, no, no, bring me. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I know all right, you too right, well. Here, let me read. I know that. you too so well. We have the Cure. <laughs> The 1975 microwave, bring me the horizon, and um, we'll still go with, yeah, we'll do Nirvana. There yeah, Nirvana. Go. Yeah, that's solid. There that's a solid, solid yeah. top. Okay, cool. Because that kind of combines everything. That combines exactly. like the bands that like changed me musically, as mm-hmm. well as like you know nirvana like i listened to them when i was a kid and i still listen to them now we were just talking about them before this podcast and yeah yeah that's pretty good i think all uh, i want to be is maddie healy and jordan fish so true i think um i think something that we might end up changing for that instead of doing just like a general top five albums we might end up doing like top five albums that changed you or that like worked with your that like grew, grew you which is probably a little bit better. Yeah, no, that's so much better. Cause that's that. Yeah, that's really it. Like the records that changed me are still pretty similar. Well, as I'm saying, there it'll probably be those bands' records. Yeah. Cause like Sempaternal, Sempaternal changed the game for me and and for you. Yeah. And so did uh, so did the record after that. So, um, but then like you know Nirvana changed the record for you when you were younger. But you know what, though? I've literally been listening to Bring Me the Horizon since I was in sixth grade. First album. All the way to Parasite. Suicide Eve, Season. Baby. Oh, like, no. Before Suicide Season. You count your blessings? Did you get... Yeah, were you into yeah, death, no. the so death I, core? Okay. So I got into them whenever Chelsea Smile was like all the rage, right? Yeah. But then I immediately dove into count your blessings and i was like oh this is wild yeah and that then first record is nuts i did compared. the same thing with under oath where i started listening to except it was backwards so i started listening to the, their only chasing safety whenever to find the great line just came out and then you and went I did to the, the same thing with the day to remember where i started listening to for those who have heart whenever homesick just came out ah uh, gotcha so i did that with a whole bunch of bands where it was like I was listening to their first record and I had no clue that their, that their next second record, record came out. I was in sixth grade. What did yeah. I know about social yeah, media? No. I wasn't on MySpace. For sure. So. <laughs> cool. Well, yeah, it was a good conversation. People getting to know you a little bit. Hopefully, people grew from it a little bit. And I hope so, man. I mean, we, I don't, I'm not the wisest man in the world, but, you know, as far as music goes, I didn't start like really. It didn't start clicking. Like I've always been passionate about music, but like mm-hmm. you could have passion and not have drive or not For know sure. where what to do with that passion. It wasn't until, you know, like 2016, 2017 that things really started just like getting hammered into my brain where I was like, this is what I must do, you know? Yeah. And now it's just like this past like year, year and a half was probably the most profound year of my life of like understanding like what I can do, what I'm doing now, what I should be doing now, and how to get to what I can be, you know? So we'll leave them with this. What's one thing that you've worked on recently that you're excited about coming out? Um, or, that has, or that has just come out? That's a song that I've been sending you with uh, for Hostile Array. 
Oh yeah, I'm hyped. The one on that, that you're writing. There's on. another song that I sent to uh, Mallory Pacific in Nashville. She's killer. That's another cool song. Like I'm, my my vision right now is to work on radio rock combined with pop music and getting it with voices who are either perfect for it or can be really creatively cool. Mm -hmm. I can see that. Someone's listening to that Roddy Rich song in my apartment complex right now. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, That's so annoying. Well, we'll end it there. We capped it at just about 45. So something like that. That's cool. Um, but yeah, thanks for coming and hanging out. Josh, no problem, man. Talking about yourself. I didn't really have a choice. <laughs> You were stuck here anyway. You're stuck at your house anyway, so you might as well. Yeah, do a I'm podcast. stuck in my house anyway until I get that negative test result. Exactly. So. Well, thanks. Thanks for listening, everybody. Hope you learned something. See you next time. See you next time. And that's it for this episode of the Home Studio Hangout Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Go check us out on Instagram at Home Studio Hangout. Give us a review on your favorite podcasting platform. And don't forget, keep on creating. See you next week.